Yes, you hear me, sir? Oh, yes, yes, perfect. Thank you, Katina, for arranging this and appreciate the, this opportunity to add my voice to the important issues that you're raising during this workshop today in Washington, D.C., which is normally home for me, but the COVID crisis has changed our travel plans, and I, too, am in Vancouver, not far from where Guy Huntington is, so. <clears throat> that's good. <laughs> I think that's kind of uh, charming that we're getting in from the West Coast. Anyway, um, as uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to participate in this uh, talk, and I'm a professor at the University of Maryland, but I am spending time this year with Peter Wallen's University of British Columbia uh, as a visiting scholar, and that's given me other opportunities to explore these issues in a positive way. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. there we go. There we go. All right, I'm always happy to represent the University of Maryland, which is using computer interaction lab, this rich interdisciplinary community. Um, uh, from computer science and the College of Information Studies, plus many other groups on campus, including the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities. Um, <clears throat> my work, uh, which I hope is familiar to some of you, I was delighted that Katina knew my work and book for many years, and the sixth edition of Designing User Interfaces describes this world of the uh, human computer interaction and tells its story of its powerful influence, which I'll discuss. Um, my own work is, uh, I hope, familiar to some of you, and some of the easy things to talk about are the idea of the link, work we did in 1985, create these highlighted clickable uh, links that take you to uh, further information. That idea traveled very well, the commercial sold for we built, and Tim Berners-Lee then included that in his 1989 uh, uh, manifesto for the web. We also developed the touchscreen, tiny keyboards, in 1988, and that idea was uh, uh, quite novel. Touchscreen keyboards would be nine inches wide. We made seven inches, five, and then three inches wide by the new process that instead of, touch, of, of activating when you land on, it would activate when you lift off. So you could put your finger on the screen and you see a cursor above it, and then you slide it around, and when you lift off, uh, Steve Jobs visited our lab, and I became a consultant for Apple for five years, so I saw how that process worked. The idea of tagging photos is also from my work, and that's a patent that I hold uh, on that topic, which is spread very widely. Um, but most of my life has been spent on visualization tools. The commercially successful Spotfire uh, system is here with multiple coordinated windows, dynamic sliders uh, and rapid updates within 160 milliseconds to ensure uh, the capacity to use the data. Um, the, the, the tree map idea was a visualization notion that I developed in, um, and it shows here stock market on a happier day uh, when stocks were rising, when the green is the stocks that are rising, the red ones are falling, um, and the area for stock indicates the market capitalization. Uh, that's been very widely used and now included in Excel uh, as a standard product. We also developed network visualization software called Node Excel, um, which is the most popular tool for, for teaching uh, social network analysis and visualization. Uh, we've recently released the second edition of the book that describes uh, network analysis and use of the tool. And in the past 10 years, I've worked on medical visualizations, your event flow, showing how patients go through the pediatric emergency care services at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. And you can see the first group of about half were treated correctly. Uh, that's the pattern we were looking for, a series of four um, examinations and a longer holding period. But there were 29 variations that were incorrect. And the... Uh, Managers of the emergency room were kind of shocked to see that that was happening, and uh, this gave them the information they needed to make re review the trend. All right, so that's where I've come from the world of HCI and information visualization. But here, the view from Vancouver on a lovely sunny morning uh, tells you that you take a breath, and we're going somewhere else, and we're going to be talking about the 
future. Uh, so, but to understand that best, I will retreat to the past and engage in a 2,000 year old debate around rationalism versus empiricism. There's two major schools of thought. Each provide value, but each have their flaws, and if we understand them both, we have a chance of building better life for everyone. The rationalism assumes the logical perfectibility of human endeavor. Aristotle is usually credited with doing that, and sitting on his couch, he could imagine and think of things and made important observations about the distinction between um, vertebrates and invertebrates. And, uh, but he also made mistakes. He was, knew that men had 32 teeth, uh, and he assumed women had 28. But he never bothered to check. So that failure of, uh, of, of empiricism, or the lack of empiricism, is what led him astray. And he was followed by the Navy Card, of course, the Noza Conference, and others. The alternate version of reality is empiricism. We need to continuously refine our belief looking at, examining, enmeshing oneself in the real world, becoming a domain expert, and studying carefully. Our heroes here are Leonardo, a hero of mine, uh, Galileo, Locke, and Hume. And in the 20th century, uh, this tradition continues with Ronald Fisher, whose statistical methods of the 1920s uh, led forward in very important ways. Um, but also had its limitations. Hypothesis testing and value as it is, uh, is not always. And John Tukey, the hero for exploratory data analysis, his book in 1977, um, understood the importance of visualization, looking at data, and so on. And this issue continues in the current debates over AI, which soon is mathematical and logical perfectibility, and that a solution and a predictive model will work in all situations and all contexts. Of course, many people recognize that as a weakness, and so they have um, uh, opened up towards more empirical methods. And the HCI community, I think, adopts a different perspective, which says study the users and understand what their users are doing and what their uh, tasks are and who they are and how they work differently. So, the AI notion continues to dominate the journalism world. And going back to these uh, covers of popular news magazines show that uh, the attraction is strong for machines that, that think uh, and the belief that machines will uh, dominate our, our world. And that notion continues in dozens, maybe hundreds of books like The Rise of the Robot, Martin Ford's book, that is widespread use of robots and declining employment opportunities and needs to change. Uh, Nick Bostrom's superintelligence champions the notion of artificial general intelligence, and the question is only when will that happen, 10, 20, or 80 years, or, you know, but it, it, it is seen as inevitable uh, that machine um, uh, the dominant intelligence on our planet. And the other book, Our Final Invention, says the end of humanity in a certain sense, the end of the human era, uh, because now evolutionarily the robots will uh, These are extreme views. Uh, on the other side, well, we see different views. Maybe the best book I would recommend to you is Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Man Destruction that points out the weaknesses in, uh, in, in big data and uh, machine learning approaches, which are used for uh, employment, for uh, parole granting, for mortgage granting, and so on. Uh, it's really a wonderfully written book by a brilliant writer, PhD mathematician from Harvard, who worked at Wall Street, and wrote this terrific book. Uh, recently, Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis' book called Rebooting AI uh, describes the failures of AI. The first half of the book is, I'm charmed by, it is all about the things that are wrong with AI. The second half, Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis and I disagree. They believe the solution is more AI, uh, artificial general intelligence, AGI, and common sense reasoning and necessary goals. They don't, so they come strongly from 
the uh, rational side, and they, the word user interface appears once in the book. Um, they don't see the role uh, of, of empiricism and of human participation. Gary Smith's AI delusion continues its questions and challenges the statistical methods. Uh, if you're going to read one uh, report of the 300 that are out there about um, principled AI and governance of AI, I recommend the recent one just last month. The Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University uh, discussed the issues in a very strong way, as you might guess, as you can see. I, I support their efforts. Uh, the issues of privacy, safety, and security, which Guy Huntington referred to. Um, or, uh, you know, are, are important components. My own emphasis will focus on human control of technology and professional responsibility uh, as important issues. Uh, the promotion of human values and then focus on international human rights it was a surprisingly strong component of many of these reports, especially from large corporations. And that was an eye opener. So you may want to look at these slides with all the links are should be available, and Katina uh, may be posting them on the website, but I've posted them on SlideShare already so that other viewers can take a look at them. So my story about HCI uh, is that the result of the last 35 years of work in HCI is that 6 billion users have something in their pocket that they can use, and they understand, and they are effective, and being in touch with family and friends, getting medical advice, conducting business, doing learning, and all these mobile applications have transformed the world in the last uh, two decades. Um, HCI succeeded because we understood the need to address diverse users, so old and young, men and women, able and disabled, and uh, the large variety of literate and illiterate people and different skills um, the HCI, and, and the good news is when you work to design for everyone, you make it better for everyone. Um, that, that's kind of, it does take some more effort, but the effort is well um, spent because the benefits come so much. Um, the other point of HCI was that it really looked at the diversity of applications from military to medical to consumer goods. Uh, it looked at the users and the data, it cared about the impacts on society, about environmental issues, about sustainability, uh, about privacy and security. Uh, as a result, the diverse interfaces and many levels of theories, principles, and guidelines. Um, I refer to one for the purpose of this talk, the Apple Design Bill of Guidelines, among the many guidelines documents, they stress that users should be in control. People, not apps, are in control. That is a distinctive force between HCI and AI. And we will come back to that. Also, flexibility. Give users complete fine brain control over their work. And the point is that this emphasizes the human being at the center and in control of what happens. The need for comprehensible, predictable, and controllable user interfaces dominates this discussion. So, by contrast, the AI design principles which I want to show you are one is humanoid robots, a continuing fantasy that does not produce commercial success stories, except maybe um, uh, crash test dummies and Disney audio animatronics. And I will not be talking much more about humanoid robots. Uh, this talk emphasizes one of the problems, which is excessive automation and the need to put uh, control back into users and limit the amount of automation or provide, let's say, more effectively, the right kinds of automation. The cell phone that we all carry, that many of us carry in our pockets, has a wonderful example on the camera. The camera there has a high degree of AI and in lighting and focus, uh, limiting jitter, many, many other things that the AI uh, strategies provide services for. And yet, the user is fully in control of the picture they take, and they can point, they can zoom, 
and they can decide when to take the picture. And that's the right model that we want to look for. We design self-driving cars, we design of many technologies which we will all be using in the coming years. There's many other concerns I have, but the focus will be on degrees of automation. So my vision for human-centered AI is to focus on people and amplify, augment, enhance, and empower people as opposed to mimic and replace and simulate people. Um, that's where we're going. We want to amplify, augment, enhance, and empower people. And the goal for me is a thousand-fold improvement You've seen this already in the provision of information by way of the web, and in search algorithms that let us find what we want, email and text, photography, navigation systems, and business formations of Airbnb and Etsy and, and so on. Uber and Lyft, these all provide new opportunities for people that are dramatic and are attractive. Uh, we also want, and that's the here, reliable, safe, trustworthy. RST is what I'll come to refer to. Uh, we need to make sure that these technologies are something we depend on, that are resilient, that are private, that are secure, um, that are environmentally productive, etc. But I will focus on reliable, safe, trustworthy, and, and define that as a three level approach to uh, government. And my goal, of course, making more people more creative more often, uh, building their self-efficacy and a while attaining society. Uh, so that's kind of the agenda, or the, the aspiration for this talk. So let me take a pause here and just say, I mean, I invite Katina or anyone for questions, maybe at this moment, anything, any questions to raise or challenges? Uh, I have a question, Professor Schneiderman, uh, but I'm wondering if the participants at home uh, who are remotely uh, logged in would like to ask a question at this point. Thank you. You could just unmute your, your microphones and fire away asking questions. Well, I know it's tough early in the morning. Well, Professor, I have a I have a question. If uh, yeah. this breaks the ice, I know you have um, more of your presentation to go through, but I'm 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 wondering what this thousandfold improvement in capabilities might look like in through your eyes. I mean, you are one of the chief design experts in the world. Uh, you've really revolutionised the way we interact with machines. What do you see as a thousandfold improvement in human capabilities? When we talk about amplification, augmentation, enhancement, what do you see? Thank you. Um, surely, I mean, we've seen that in these examples that I have, and the challenge is finding new ones, breaking through the frontiers of what we see now and thinking about new directions. I do see grand opportunities for improving education and I think we're going to see in the next three weeks, um, or three months, let's say, 30 years of progress in collaborative technology that will allow universities to become virtual. That's my own university, and many others are continuing moving to do. Uh, but it will require the development of, uh, of, of new tools that enable um, professors to lecture to large classes, students to ask questions in the way we're doing now. Zoom. And this example of this workshop is a capacity we did not have um, just a decade ago. And the fluid movement that I can speak and that dozens or hundreds can hear, ask questions, and maybe have discussions of their own is an example of the kind of collaborative technologies that empower people um, in, in dramatic ways. I think medical care will dramatically improve as we find more powerful ways. And again, using AI, uh, pathologists will be much more effective in tracking and finding uh, cancer tumors um, and in providing better treatments. I think that we will move from a world of clinical trials, and there are more than 200,000 worldwide, to a world, move to a world where every patient every day is engaged in a clinical trial. 
treatment, each case, each surgery um, becomes part of the data set from which we all benefit and we learn to, uh, clinicians learn to make better judgments and diagnoses and patients become more informed about their own condition and learn more about how they can be responsible for their own health care. So those are a few examples already of the, the ways in which I think we'll, we'll see these kinds of improvements. I think creative opportunities, capacity to write more and disseminate. <coughs> We've seen already <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, the success of, of preprint services like Archive and a variety of others, which in the last weeks have been put to work ambitiously in fighting the COVID uh, crisis um, by physicians around the world who are more than ever sharing data, sharing results, exchanging and discussing things. Their own abilities and their community abilities are certainly amplified dramatically by these capacities that seem quite natural um, already. Yesterday I read a paper uh, about the crisis in Wuhan and non-pharmaceutical treatments and that paper had just appeared a day or two before. And the global uh, dissemination of information speeds the process of care and public health. Those are a few. Thank you for your question. I think I'll move on from here. And the focus of this talk is a reframing of our thinking about the relationship of technology. So I go back to 1980 when Tom Sheridan, an MIT professor, had laid out the levels of automation or levels of autonomy. And he had described 10 levels from, from full human control to machine automation. And that one dimensional model had enormous impact, even on me. In 1986, in the first edition of my book, I had a section which discussed this issue and it talked about balancing automation human control. And the assumption was that you had to choose some point. And if you wanted more computer automation, you got less human control. And that idea was strong in my mind. For decades, even as I spoke to Tom Sheridan uh, the past year, he said he never understood or believed, never believed that his simple one-dimensional model would travel so widely and have such But its influence was in some ways negative because it limited peace. And I began to realize, as I wrote later editions of the book, that the goal should be to ensure human control while increasing automation. And even I puzzled over what that meant and how to realize it. And I kept thinking about how do you achieve that kind of goal. And it struck me that there were really two dimensions to look at. There was the dimension of human control and the dimension of computer automation. And the goal should be to get high levels of human control and high levels of computer automation. And I will illustrate it simply this way, in a two-dimensional grid that, you know, where the goal is reliable, safe, and trustworthy. And that's the aspiration. And the question is, how does design enable us to do this? Uh, the paper I recently completed that will appear by April 1 in the Inter International Journal of Human Computer Interaction is available online in the archive.org um, uh, services. And uh, I think Katina has a copy which so the simple cases of reliable, safe, and trustworthy might be the elevator or the camera. We get in, we push the button for the elevator, the light goes on, we see the elevator coming down, the doors open, we get inside, we press the seventh floor, the light goes on, doors close, and we then see we're on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh floor, and we arrive. And this is a mature technology that's evolved over 100 years with triple redundant safety systems to prevent elevators from dropping and limit the potential for harm. Uh, elevators are in a controlled environment in the elevator shaft where few things can go wrong. 
Uh, and so it becomes a very successful system. It may have lots of the AI for managing as you need, especially in large buildings, many elevators, but it's the kind of system we want to see, where the humans have a high degree of control, they get with just what they want, but there's a rich um, technology that ensures that they Camera, I mentioned already, the digital camera gives you a high degree of control over the images you take, and yet there's a high degree of automation behind it. So we now realize that this diagram shows there is a place for full computer control where we need rapid action like the deployment of airbags within 200 milliseconds, um, or pacemakers that operate for years um, without human intervention inside patients' uh, chests. Uh, these are admirable, and there are many other things. But we have to remember also that there are places for human mastery as well. That the bicycle or the piano are places I generally want to be master and charge myself. I want to accomplish things. I want to be creative. I want to explore. I want to make it. And that's acceptable. So already this diagram and this two-dimensional chart shows us there's a landscape, there's a different set of possibilities and we should be aware that the idea of full computer control or as often it's called autonomous systems autonomy are only necessary in very narrow cases and even in those cases we want to limit autonomy and ensure that it's monitored in a good way for example airbags do save about 2500 lives in the u.s per year but in the early days, the airbags also inadvertently killed about 200 children and elders because of inappropriate um, deployments. And the result of that is a better design uh, because we have the data about what went wrong. And so collecting the data and ensuring that we have reliable, safe, and trustworthy would move the airbag system up more to the reliable, safe, and trustworthy. Similarly, pacemakers, are increasingly monitored, tracked, and patients are increasingly tracked so that we know how well they're working, and that makes for a better pacemaker design and better system. We have to realize, though, there are dangers uh, at the precipices. If we go too far, uh, we get excessive automation. The Boeing 737 MAX is a clear example uh, of that, where the designers built the MCAS system in such a way that the pilots were not even informed of its possibility, of its presence. And as the IBM online guidelines say, that imperceptible AI is unethical AI. And so um, excessive automation is a problem that happens in many place, places. We'll see about it in self driving cars and the dangers of doing automation because we can do automation even when it may be counterproductive. Many examples of the failures of excessive automation are documented of flash crashes in stock markets and high-speed trading algorithms, uh, or the tragedy of the Patriot missile system during the Iraq war, shooting down friendly planes. An American and a British plane were shot down because of excessive automation. Um, but excess, oops, um, excessive human control is another issue as well that we have to be aware of, and people are imperfect and make mistakes. And so systems called interlocks or guards are, are proposed and implemented in many, many ways. Um, the simple one of your self-cleaning oven, which does not allow the door to be open when the temperature is above 600 degrees. Uh, there are countless such small guards and conventions to more major stories. The one I'd like to tell is of the early days of jet flying around 1950. The uh, uh, way to slow down the plane and lands on the runway is to uh, uh, put on reverse thrusters. However, sometimes the pilots would engage them too soon. They might be 20 feet above the ground as they're approaching the landing, and they hit a bump of air and they think they've landed, they switch on the reverse thrusters and pancake down the runway. Uh, the solution to this um, is uh, that you, the system has a strain gauge in landing gear, and so the uh, 
reverse thrusters can only be engaged when the strain gauge indicates that the plane has touched down. There are many such examples. Positive train control uh, prevents train drivers from driving too fast in terminal areas or going too fast around curves. You may recall two years ago outside of New York City, a driver was going 90 miles an hour on a curve that should have driven at 50 miles an hour. The plane, the, the, the train derailed and was killed. So we need to build those kinds of systems. There are many examples. Okay, so just to give an idea about how this works in design, let's take the, the case of pain control design. The old-fashioned, low-tech, low automation, low control model was a morphine drip down. A very effective idea from the days of World War II, where the morphine would drip at a steady rate, whether the patient needed it or not, um, and it was on Computer control systems led to an automatic dispenser that would limit the amount of morphine with related to patient uh, variables and, and uh, sensors of heart rate and breathing and so on. Uh, so that was an improvement. But then the patient-controlled analgesia, PCA, became the dominant form where the patient was given a kind of squeeze trigger that they could squeeze to get extra morphine if they needed it. Because pain, human pain, is individually experienced and not measurable by machine. So the patient could get more and more, but the uh, guards on it prevented uh, patients from getting more than a, ex than a dose of morphine every 10 minutes um, and would limit the number to eight, let's say, over a four hour period. So there were ways that patients could be limited. And then, of course, the fully functional patient-guided system, but clinician-monitored, you can imagine a centralized control facility in a hospital where 100 such systems are monitored, and the patient, um, uh, the sensors on the patient, the patient biometric variables guide what's going on, and the central office can monitor failures understand problems that emerge, and then develop more and more reliable systems. So that gives you an idea about how this two-by-two two, uh, grid um, shapes design. And that's what we'll use now to talk about cars. Um, the 1980 car was a high degree of control, um, but um, an, a moderate degree of, of uh, computer automation. We now have the self-driving car in 2020, uh, which has a high degree of control, but maybe less human control. And while there are many virtues and the goal, I certainly agree with of safe driving uh, is valuable. I think what we need to do is move towards a 2020 car, uh, 2040 car, which uh, uh, limits the computer control to appropriate situations so that we can get the benefits of safety. But as we know, current systems are not yet in that category. The Tesla crash in 2016, carefully studied by the National Transportation Safety Board, and, uh, which issued a very readable 60-page report on that crash, does mention excessive automation, criticizes Tesla for giving the label autopilot, which suggests an excessive uh, capability on the part of the car, and the failures that occurred in that and other crashes have been widely discussed and studied. And so we need to move from the, uh, the current levels of computer control to a more reliable and safe system, possibly with outside monitoring as well. Maybe you envision a regional center for, uh, let's say, air traffic control for self-driving cars um, that would uh, give uh, attention that would allow a centralized uh, resource to monitor tens of thousands of cars, and as weather conditions change, as road conditions change, it might change the speed for all the cars uh, on the road, or would enable um, more more effective and safer use. So I think uh, this model, um, which many people have appreciated, uh, suggests that this opens up. 
So, you know, I repeat that my goal here is high levels of human control and high levels of computer automation uh, with RST, reliable, safe, and trust. Let me just say a moment about those three words. Now, I think of them, and it will be the topic of the forthcoming paper. <clears throat> Reliability is a property of the technology itself. There are design methods that will improve reliability. Flight data recorders for every robot, for example, audit trails and product logs will now enable retrospective analysis. It's important. Uh, there are strategies in modular design. <clears throat> there are strategies for reliable testing and validation for ensuring training data is unbiased and complete. <clears throat> So those are properties for the system builder and design. Safeness and the culture of safety of the organization in which systems are developed is a second level. There are many opportunities for intervention here, and cultures of safety, a term frequently used in medical um, systems, but also for civil aviation, um, describes the way in which there's an obsession with safety that's shared by the leadership and all the participants in the system, all the stakeholders, and the processes for studying failures and near misses and keeping track are extremely important. And then further, an open discussion of failures and near misses. Finally, the third level of analysis is trustworthiness, which is uh, delivered by the independent oversight of other organizations, not the one that built it. So independent oversight can be delivered through government regulation, um, and that can be problematic, but has been successful in many cases, such as automobile safety and automobile uh, efficiency, gas efficiency. Also, trustworthiness can be uh, arranged through external validation, like underwriters' laboratories. Uh, we're seeing a growth of that for the AI community. I still hope the insurance industry will move forward and do what it did so exceptionally well in the building trades, where the building codes provide the guidelines for design of safe buildings, for electrical, for structural integrity, for water supplies, and sewage, uh, all the properties that we want uh, I described in the building company, uh, construction companies uh, adhere to that. They propose to the uh, zoning uh, commission what they want to do. Uh, they get approval. They build the building. The inspector comes by, and the inspector says, yes, you've done what you propose to do, and then you can get insurance. But the insurance industry is, is yet a third pillar on this. I think a fourth pillar we're seeing emerging now are that the independent auditing agencies, Ernst Young, KPMG, Deloitte, so on, are rising up to do more than just the audit of the financial status, but they are auditing the use of artificial intelligence in large scale application. And then there's a role for independent organizations such as um, uh, NGOs and professional societies. Uh, the Robotics Institute for Automation does provide the right kind of guidelines and certifications that make for trustworthy industrial robots. Um, there's also you know, coalitions of industry groups like the Partnership on AI, which is taking an approach to uh, build this kind of trustworthy and safe environments. So the design principles of comprehensible, predictable, and controllable are important. Continuous display of status and performance feedback. These are larger principles discussed in many places, but that's where I see the design. And just some examples of predictive search keeps users in control when designed right. When I click on something like you type on UPC, I get a series of choices that guide me. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go through quickly here. Mercedes-Benz parking assist provides the right kind of feedback. Uh, Toyota as well. The textually rich informative feedback that shows you where uh, you are, gives you a path. It moves along at any time you can stop it, uh, and it gives you full information about what's, what's happening. Um, 
I would say a particularly useful example is Jeff Peer's article about three examples of providing agency and automation for the graphics. He writes that to the goal is to productively employ um, AI methods while ensuring that people remain in control, unconstrained in pursuing complex and exercising their own. I think he gets that right. Um, so that's another resource. All right, I'm going to take another pause here, take a little breath, maybe pause and see if there are any questions. Maybe go back to my diagram and see if that's the any question arise. Regina or others on the audience? This is uh, Professor Steyerman. Okay. Go, go ahead. Online? Thank Hi. You. Um, you can't see me because I'm still working from my uh, my rudimentary. Um, this is Chris Preble from the Cato Institute. I'm uh, working from my remote office in my dining room. Um, Professor Steinerman, I I'm struck by all of the examples that you cite of how this process has evolved of this blend of, I think this chart is excellent, the blend of human control and computer control. Um, I, you mentioned very few instances where there was sort of a regulatory framework or government action or anything like that. that is that your sense that, that this is mostly an iterative process, mostly driven by private actors, by by the developers, by by uh, contractors, by insurance companies, uh, et cetera. Uh, can you think of an example of where government intervention was a critical component of finding the right balance, or is it your yes, sense thank that you. that it's a good question? Um, I think the, the clearest example is civil aviation, where the FAA has, for decades, uh, been a leader in uh, developing the safe civil aviation system we have today. The set of oversight mechanisms they have are really essential. Um, we can see what happens when that fails. The FAA, uh, in its certification of the Boeing 737 MAX, gave over independent oversight to Boeing. Uh, there are many versions of the history of the 737 MAX, but certainly one component was the disturbing fact when the FAA uh, turned over the certification. Um, to Boeing and allow Boeing to self-certify or provide so-called independent oversight. Um, the FAA claimed that their reduction in budgets uh, limited their capacity to provide the kind of oversight that they had and certification of new plans that they had, that they had uh, developed. So uh, that's probably the clearest case. The National Transportation Safety Board has a very positive role in retrospective forensic analysis of failures, also very important, not just in aviation, but trains and boats and, and uh, other forms of transportation. So those would be government-guided forms, but I think in the current political climate, recommending new government regulation has become very difficult. Although there is effort, I would say, on many, many in agencies to step up their role. I have proposed and a talk you can find online, a national algorithm safety board where these kind of processes for algorithms in financial, medical, uh, legal fields would come under scrutiny of, um, of a federal agency. I don't expect a national algorithm safety board to emerge, but I do think the agencies like the SEC, uh, the F FAA, NTSB, NIST, and others are stepping forward to do it. I've been disappointed, let's say, by government, um, the degree of regulation for electronic medical records, work of mine over the last 10 years, where although we have some success stories to tell largely, the 1,700 companies who supply components of electronic medical record systems are free to do as they wish. There are no certification processes for electronic medical records. They are not medical devices, which is what the um, uh, who the Drug Administration supervises, and there's no willingness to expand the scope of the FDA uh, or reclassify electronic medical records as a device. And so we're left without the regulation. And I think the harmful systems that are often put in place are slow to do that. Let me take a pause. Do you want to comment on my response? 
No, thank you very much. That was that was helpful. Thank you. All right. I think we'll see the emergence of it. So let me go on to just one more section here and closing comments about a larger issue of responsibility. That to me will be the defining word for the next decade. If we get this right, if we think about the human responsibility uh, for, uh, for systems, we have a chance to get these systems to turn out well. And by that, I mean many of the issues that are already discussed of accountability, legal liability, let's say moral responsibility as well, and fairness, transparency, with a great growth of research and interest in this area, you might look at the FAT ML conferences, Fairness, Accountable, and Transparent Machine Learning, FAT ML. You'll find seven or eight years of conference papers that are devoted to this topic. It's heartening that that topic is expanding. Similarly, explainability and interpretability <clears throat> are seen as aspirations. Um, the DARPA XAI uh, uh, <clears throat> program, which includes 11 projects, um, is an example that's been going on for few years now. Uh, but I think we see a huge, in the last 9 to 12 months, huge growth of research projects and PhDs, a student working on the notions of explainability. Uh, it's also a separate topic of discussion about how to do it right. I think retrospective post hoc uh, explainability can be improved on by the methods that have been learned over in the last 30 years in the computer interaction. Um, but, you know, as I talk about reliable systems, I said that these three levels, um, I've mentioned some of these things already the audit trails to review failures and near misses, making the failures more understandable, assigning responsibility to individuals to organizations um, and uh, understanding what goes wrong. So they're called audit trails or product logs, or I like the idea of a flight data recorder for every robot. Is there. A standardized benchmark tasks in, in, in individual industries for verification and validation, continuous improvement, and then data quality methods for bias testing and that is good. So this ABCD framework attain reliable design. Then the cultures of safety is a well-studied set of principles that make for these open management strategies of leadership commitment, safety, frequent discussions, open and involving not just the leadership, but everyone in an organization. Uh, and the discussion of failures and near misses. Internal oversight boards for problems and future plans, public reports of failures and then the third layer of trustworthiness comes from, we've discussed this already, government regulation, um, insurance uh, companies uh, require fair standards, and then accounting firms uh, with audit systems, um, and voluntary industry plans like the partnership of AI and professional systems. So that's my formula for reliable, safe, and trust. And the goal, I'll repeat in my closing slide here, just to say, amplify, augment, enhance, and empower people. I see a world that's rich with human control and creative opportunity. I think people are different from machines. People are special. They have remarkable capabilities and unbounded creative potential. And we need to do more to focus on that. Uh, um, many people, of course, are aligned with this notion. But there is a strong grow, a strong force of people who believe that the machines are intelligent and smart and they deserve to be in control. I don't see that in our future. I think those notions are, are self-limiting and we need to move on to better strategies. Uh, so I just close and say thank you and remind you that this two-level, two-dimensional model uh, opens up thinking to new possibilities. And I welcome discussions, but before I leave, I just invite you to the Human Computer Interaction Lab at University of Maryland's 37th Annual Symposium on May 28th, when we will hold a workshop on uh, reliable, safe, and trustworthy uh, AI systems. Um, uh, that date, of course, is only two months away, and the COVID crisis may force us to go virtual, but I hope we will be 
hold that meeting anyway, and we gain fluency with these kind of uh, systems that support collaboration. So I'll end with that and back up here and invite you uh, to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and attention. Thanks to Katina and her team for putting this together uh, and for addressing the important issue. Very interesting day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schneiderman. Thank you very much. Um, I invite, uh, first off, uh, Guy Huntington, if you're still online, um, I know, again, it's been a long morning for you, but we've had the pleasure of listening to your talk, followed up by this wonderful design-oriented talk. And I'm wondering if you wanted to have the first go at an opening discussion um, that possibly Professor Schneiderman could share or respond to. Uh, no, no, I, I really like your presentation there. It was really, really good. Um, but my my concern is how we're going to operationalize this globally. How are we going to operationalize AI and the management of it? And so all the things you talked about are all logical. They all make utter good sense. But how are we going to regulate AI such that we can then manage it, such that we don't we don't not get frauded uh, bizarrely like we are today? And how are we going to basically determine the uh, bot that we're talking to? And how are we going to in our political discord, yes. which is really what um, Bruce Schneider was talking about. That, that's, really, that's really where we have to be. I, I, that's, that, that curve of Pat Scannell is always in my head. Um, I support your notion that identity management is an important issue. I agree that um, identity is now a left to hold. We had, we believe, 20, 15, 10 years ago that the mm -hmm. web and the internet and social media would provide um, opportunities for people at the margins of society. And it, it has, in fact, proven to be that way. But the number of malicious actors um, have also become empowered and grown. And so the notions of providing limitations, and I think. Um, you know, the biometric approaches can be one component of making that happen. Um, I'm sure you're aware there'll be certain resistance to that. But I think there's a lot more <clears throat> of pressure we could um, place on organizations, companies, uh, platforms like Facebook, which I think could have done many more things that uh, would have uh, limited the damage. I think the number of bots automated systems is excessive, those could be brought down and prevented. The, uh, fake news and um, false data are other important issues. And the criminal effort, the role of malicious actors, I think is extremely important, whether criminals, political activists, terrorists, or so on, is important. Last week, um, Microsoft carried out a very important um, effort, which was documented in David Sanger's article in the Washington Post, um, where Microsoft coordinated with 26 countries and took down a botnet of millions, millions of servers that had captivate had had had, had uh, millions of URLs, and they uh, were able to take these down. So. We're seeing how companies are stepping forward because government agencies, while they should be doing this job, are not being given the opportunities to do this. So we may want to turn and put more pressure on companies to follow the good model that Microsoft did. And I particularly think Facebook's a serious uh, problem here in that they refuse to limit false political advertising. I think that's totally irresponsible uh, process. And they need to be much more open about um, the usage of their services. And I would say, so, so there's a few things Facebook could do. One, they could uh, take down the botnets much more actively. Uh, um, secondly, they could limit uh, false and fake news. Um, and third, they could empower their community 
to provide more self-limiting technologies. I mean, Facebook is all about the gas pedal. The only thing you can do is like something, okay? You can't dislike, question, or worry about something. You can't raise it. You can block it, but that only blocks it for yourself. And if it is a hate crime or something more serious and obvious, you can report it. But the capacity to say, I don't know about this post. I'd like, I don't approve of it. I don't think it's credible. Some way to say dislike and allow people to slow the dissemination of things that are questionable to be social. So those are three approaches that I think could be helpful and opiates. I do support the notion of increased identity management on the part of Facebook uh, and a more, more rigorous approach. You want to respond, Guy? Well, it goes way beyond Facebook at all. Like, um, we have Facebook has about fifty-two thousand attributes per person. It's rapidly growing, and that's for billions of people around the planet. So you have the whole use of identity. You have Google and L. They do behavioral marketing, and uh, we are, we the person, which is really Katina's point in her graph, is that we're sort of left behind. We, the user, are producing the data, but then it's being sold and then used for us to service products. And uh, right. the underlying component is we have to basically regain control of our legal identity. And then we have to have choices that we're able to make. So we may give up our privacy. So yeah, I want to give it up, or I might even be paid to give up my privacy. But we have to have the legal identity that functions in all parts of the planet that enables us to do that. And uh, we don't have those tools, and no company is going to be able to give us those tools. That's a government responsibility, and requires all the governments on the planet to coordinate, because they're the source of our legal identity from when we're born. I hope you're right, but getting governments to take action and coordinate in that way is proven difficult. And so I agree. But then we have Pat Skinnell's curve. So I, uh, that's why I tell people they say they always raise up the thing like, "Guy, don't you?" They say, basically, guy, you must be smoking dope. Don't you realize how the planet really works? And we should be pressuring governments, but I think also we should be pressuring companies and platforms do have the responsibility. I, I agree, but I think the legal identity then is a, it's a government responsibility. And that's why I put the why is that true? And we have to basically... Why is that the only politicians, way? The politicians have to learn how to help themselves, which is the first point of my, of my political screen, which is that by helping themselves, they can basically help themselves get reelected. They can maintain control of their messages better, and then they can basically serve the business and the citizen community. Hey, that is how we're going to sell it. I'd right. like to see that, but I don't want that to be the only way. Let me return to a comment you made earlier about uh, the need for individuals to receive payment, uh, micro payments for their contributions. Jaron Lanier has been the champion for uh, this notion for at least a decade, and um, I think that's really an important notion that um, we would see better identity management if the companies knew they had to pay people for the good things they did and the contributions they made. So those those forms of micropayment, and he lays it out in great detail in several books that he's uh, written on the topic, I think are valuable opportunities. But, you know, his, his more recent book just says, get off of Facebook. And I have retreated from Facebook because I just don't, I don't like seeing what's going on there. I would say I'm still on Twitter in a more careful way, and I celebrate Twitter's uh, decision not to take political advertisements. Uh, so I think, you know, the companies have direct, quick, and very powerful impacts, and we have to uh, be lobbying the companies as well as the government to step up to their responsibility. Yeah, I agree. Katina, can I? Yes, you can. Okay, others. You can I hand raised. Yes. Uh, greetings from Hard County. Very close to your home, probably. <laughs> um, my, my question is when I think about digital divide, I see three levels of it. The first one is the one with access, you know, people being able to get to technology. The second one is the skill, people being able to use. And the third one, I call a new digital divide, which is awareness of understanding the outcomes of a connected algorithm-based digital life. So 
basically instead of the have and have nots that you have people with technology and without technology, I say the people with awareness and without awareness, that is the ones who go to face app and happily uh, trade their biometrics um, for uh, you know seeing how they're gonna look like in 20 years. I say, just sit and wait till you get there. Uh, but well, what, what, I find, what I find interesting is that I start to see, for example, in Finland, some uh, public programs of digital education that is already trying to get the public to actually understand those outcomes of a connected life. So um, I would like to get your opinion regarding this, that when we think about the algorithms, we think about this, this ecosystem that we have, and this will be a bit of my talk this afternoon, um, how do you see that we can, you know, I, I, the companies I see that, how do you think we can help uh, to, to get, you know, get the public system of education or communities and society in general to actually understand that when kids are having uh, classes, like my, my daughter has here in Howard County, uh, classes of technology, um, most of the classes are either on access and skills, but, you know, very little about awareness. Um, very so good. So I think there's three components to this. One is design. Okay. Um, you know, if the design is comprehensible, predictable, and controllable, effectively developed and tested and refined, then people will get better control over their own privacy. They'll understand better, and more transparent systems, and will come to understand what's needed. I think that's uh, the key thing because design spread very rapidly. There's 2.5 million apps in the in the app store are designed according to the Apple guidelines. And there's consistent design in terms of the features. And those things build in. And you know, it's harder to make a poor design when you've got tools based on principles and theories that have been validated through research. So HCI's great success is that the few thousand researchers produce results which then could be embedded in design guidelines and then propagated the tools used by millions of developers to develop those apps, which are used by billions of people. So, you know, the first level to get what you want, which I fully agree with, is better design. And again, we see the success stories of text messaging, where people have a pretty good sense of control. They can see what they're typing, and when they, you know, send that message, it says delivered, they get informative feedback, it's simple, it's clear, it's safe. Underneath, there's huge mountains of AI and networking and systems that go on of great complexity, but for most users, most of the time, the message is pretty clear. I wrote to my wife, I sent her a message, she got it. And that's the kind of you know, simple clarity of an elevator or a text messaging system that we want to propagate. So, secondly, education, of course. That's a, that's a, and you describe how school districts and governments might describe and promote education. I certainly agree uh, with that. I think the third is going to be the companies and getting them to address it. But I would add another one to your list, which is the community-based bottom-up approach. Yeah. Because the way, you know, uh, my children and my grandchildren learn about this technology is from their parents. And the social mechanisms, which are uh, done by informal networks, can also be nicely supplemented. They are by, by online collaborative mechanisms that allow people to ask questions. Here's one yesterday. I had a wonderful experience about education. So I, I bought a new. Um, power cable for the laptop I'm using right now. And when it arrived, I came to see the power cable was 65 watts. And the one I'm using was 45 watts. And I said, oh my gosh, is this 65 watt gonna blow my machine out? And I really worried about connecting. Uh, especially because I had this thought this morning, I didn't wanna put it, I didn't wanna plug it in. And I thought, okay, I went online and I asked the question. And sure enough, there were answers for me. And it said, yeah, that's fine. Going from 45 to 65 is good. If you have 65 and you're trying 45, that might be a problem. Okay? But 
went online, and I was also astonished. I, I, it's more than 15 years ago, Microsoft's most valuable programmer program, which um, provided the kind of discussion groups uh, for professionals, and that's propagated it across community-based systems, has been enormously successful. Uh, so I think you want to uh, talk about centralized government and county <clears throat> level school systems, but decentralized bottom-up approaches um, as well, and the intermediate ones. Consumer interest groups have a role as well, parent groups, et cetera. There's, there's many layers to it. Don't just, I would say, expand the notion from centralized ones to ones which can have low-level ones as well as intermediate players. You want to engage the consumers' union. You want to engage the Better Business Bureau. Existing trusted institutions have enormous power and capacity to do something, rather than the difficulty of enraging top-down and also the sparseness of the bottom-up. So intermediate level of organizations could be very powerful. Right, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, think we, I think the more we can get into a societal awareness and discussion of different stakeholders, we can definitely, you know, bring this this awareness to to be, be more pervasive in every single forum. So, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate. It. Thank you. Other questions, Katina? Yes. 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 <laughs> How is that, Professor Schneider? And I think I'm back. Uh, my question pertains to. The current situation we're in. Okay, okay I, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having some mute problems there. I reviewed uh, a special issue for Robotics and Automation magazine a couple of years ago. I've got a few papers on the LC framework, uh, ethics, society, uh, and law. Uh, I got a few papers on experimental robotics approaches and a few papers on responsible innovation and development. And today you spoke to us about design and the human uh, computer sort of reference point that we want to maintain our human autonomy throughout. So let's, let's take this crisis uh, as an example uh, and look at pandemics in general. In 2003, I remember the company I worked for, Nautua Networks, um, released a application for the SARS virus uh, within 48 hours, uh, working with Sunday Telecom in Hong Kong. And the deployment uh, created an app that allowed users to know when they were nearing a SARS-infected building of about one kilometer proximity. And so my question to you is, in times of crisis, do we ditch our understanding of design principles and development and go for the rapid, agile, I will now, you know, place this app or this system or this level of automation or this warning um, or emergency alert system. I, I place it in the community so that the community can use it to quarantine, uh, use it to stay safe, blah, blah, blah. My question is, what, what, ha what happens to, to design principles and our approaches of what we know is a trusted methodology uh, when we get to, to times of crisis or times of perceived crisis? Professor Schneiderman. I don't think those are at odds. I think that's uh, uh, the design training, design thinking that's, that should be made more pervasive in our educational systems um, will prepare people to deal with these emergency situations. The agile methods are not at with design thinking. Um, I agree that an extensive uh, design process of observation for weeks and months and then design, you know, the, the, the double diamond of divergent thinking and convergence action, uh, these are, uh, these sometimes can take longer, but they also can be made uh, speedy as well. But the fundamental both Fundamental training in design is what I think will accelerate uh, the, the services in times of crisis. So I do think we're seeing that. And for example, public health design. I think the uh, I yesterday read a paper about the Wuhan 
non-pharmaceutical intervention. That was a design. You know, there was a, a, a careful design about how you provide a kind of isolation uh, that proved to be quite effective in reducing the spread rate from 3.4 down to 0.2. Uh, so those kind of things uh, can be effective. And remember, we're talking about design, not just of products, but the services and of communities and of social structures as well. So uh, design is a very powerful notion, uh, and I would uh, I just encourage uh, attention to it. We have examples of Carnegie Mellon University, Stanford University, Simon Fraser here in Vancouver, which have made design a, a, a priority. And I think we want to see it. The Ontario College of Art and Design, another exemplary group right, led by Sarah Diamond, who has you know harnessed design for social good. And so I think that's where the future is going. Um, if I could plug my own writings, I mean, I have a book from 2016 called The New ABCs of Research. And the New ABCs of Research suggests that science plus engineering plus design are the three methods we need to be teaching our students at every level in the future. It used to be that research was science. It was hypothesis testing and the scientific method. But after World War II, engineering became a research method. And it actually has fewer clarities about what engineering research method is, but that's a long discussion. But design thinking and design methods um, have arisen, and they become, you know, if you search on things like um, uh, services, you'll see that the term design after 1975 became more common than science or engineering in the, in the uh, popular and, and research literature. So design is on the asset, uh, but it's um, not as widely appreciated as I think it should. So I'm all fan of making design as and integrating design and agile methods, as you suggest. These are, these are very harmonious possibilities. So I thank you for that response, and I, I want to tie in Guy's talk now, um, because I guess Professor Schneiderman, you're talking about design, and uh, in fact, Guy, you forced us to think a little bit further about perhaps implementation and governance. Uh, oh. And if we look at this cycle, right, this this traditional systems development life cycle, we've got the problem. Uh, we, we've got uh, we've done our interviewing. Uh, if we're using a co-design approach and we're bringing the, the user along the process with us to develop something that will be useful. But let's take the COVID scenario for a moment. Let's consider that uh, things escalate globally. Uh, we put in some systems uh, to allow us to manage the situation better. But just like in Australia, we now have apps that are asking people to self-disclose whether they've got sniffles, they've got temperature, they've got a sore throat, uh, they are feeling unwell and run down, and everyone is carrying an app, and there's self-disclosure daily uh, as we try to minimize the extent of the reach of this uh, outbreak. The question I have is, when do we make the leap from the thinking uh, Professor Schneiderman, that you proposed to us, to the questions that Guy is raising his, in his presentation of identity and the management of this whole process of which part of us are saying, well, it's a private-public partnership potentially, it's, it's government doing something, it's uh, industry doing something, but how does that actually work in practice? And I think that's the questions, Guy, you're asking. Um, yeah. Um, what is the leap you were suggesting is needed? The, the leap is going from the design to the implementation, which we do as professionals mm -hmm. every day. Um, yes. Yeah, we go from a high-level design, we do a detailed design, and yes. then off we go to implementing. Is the, is, I, I, I'm just trying to connect the two talks together. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. The, and the use case. And the use case yeah. of... Yeah understandable what you're what you're uh, seeking i mean implementation is a huge problem and 
the National Institute of Health has been foremost in advocating implementation science, the study of implementation, because they came to realize that the research results of the last 30, 40 years were not making it into widespread use. And so we have a real challenge in understanding how to scale up and how to go broad and how to deal with distinct contexts. So I'm all in favor of the study of implementation science, the new ABCs of research. Uh, the ABC is a bit of a, a, a line. It stands for many things like achieving breakthrough collaborations is one of them. But the central one is applied and basic mind. Applied and basic mind. The old way of thinking of research was the so-called linear model. You start with laboratory research, and then you search for applications, you develop products, and you go to market. It's a simple, clear, and compelling model. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it rarely works. <laughs> OK? Yes. And the linear model has been challenged since 1970s um, as something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. And by the 1990s, there were stronger voices. A stirs quadrant is maybe that, and I hope my book adds on top of that. And I'm pleased it's gained, um, it's gained influence in many universities and beyond that the goal is not just to do basic research in the lab, but what I call the twin win. The twin win. What you want to do is have published papers that are breakthrough theories and validated solutions ready for dissemination. Mm -hmm. And that's what academics do. Now, the evidence is extremely potent uh, that if you do that, especially by academics partnering with professionals who are facing real problems, that's the formula for success. Papers which have academics plus at least one co author from government, industry, NGOs, hospitals, and so on, papers which have one co author have three to eight times as many scientific citations. It's a dramatic effect across private and public universities, the Harvards and the Stanfords, the Arizona States and the Berkeleys and the UPCs, all of those places share this, 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 this profile. It's not a small effect, it's a huge effect. Three to eight times as many citations as articles by academics only. So my current phrasing of this is that what you want to pursue is what I call posh research, mm -hmm. posh for problem owners collaborating with solution holders. And when you have that partnership from the beginning and co-authorship, you've got a chance to produce powerful implementation, which becomes widely accepted. Thank you. Uh, I think. Um, can I speak to that? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Give your emails. Give me your emails yeah. by the last few days, please. Yeah. Um, I want to start taking a different tap. So let's say you have all these thousands of devices out there, all these apps that people are using, and you also have all these wearable devices, and they're all producing data per second. That data is not flowing into medical databases. It's flowing into private consumer databases, like Google, like Facebook, like whomever. And if it flows into an app provider, it's immediately being sold on the market to others. So then you have this rich store of data, which is no longer in a medical database. And it is basically tracking you. So then you apply AI to that. And now basically then an insurer in the future can go back and say, oh, you have the coronavirus without you even admitting it. They'll be able to go pay for that. And all of a sudden, you've lost control of your identity, your insurance, everything. And you have no control. So my point is, is basically we need to bring back control to ourselves, not just in a nation state around the planet, because that data could be sitting in China or Russia or the United States or Europe or wherever. And we have to basically give ourselves control. The EU has a GDPR, Section 17, the Erasure Act, which is great. It enables a person to basically erase them. However, it's not going to be enforceable outside the EU. So if you have all this data sitting around the planet, then basically, you're, you're screwed as a citizen. So my point is, is that we first of all have to rethink our digital, our legal identity physically. Then we have to rethink it digitally. Then we have to re redo our laws so that they're enforceable. 
because today they're not enforceable. That is the point. And all this design stuff and that, it's all wonderful and you're utterly right there. But in practice out there in the real world where the implementation is, we have lots of malicious people, with lots of people making money, and the person is basically just the fodder for the kid. I'm mostly sympathetic to what you're saying there. I think there are those dangers you see are, are, are correct. I think I celebrate the GDPR. I think it's had a broad effect. And I know May 26th last year, when that went into uh, effect, I got dozens of emails from every service, US-based ones included, which were international, and therefore they were adhering to the GDPR rules as well. So uh, I think those those rules are a good start. Um, some of them are vague, some of them need clarification, uh, but uh, it, it was a good step forward, and I think we'll see more of that. So I think advocacy for those kind of principles that you're describing. And then I think we need to go beyond principles and should and descriptions of must or it's imperative. And we have to get down to the ways in which we want to engage individuals, organizations, consumer groups, journalists, educators, and the whole stack of society up to you know the, the political act. Activists to be uh, engaged in this mission. So I, I think advocacy, um, reaching out to others, and speaking as you're doing uh, is an important process, making people aware of the dangers, giving them hope because if you have a clear vision, and then pilot projects with companies would be an important way. And I encourage you to step forward, maybe you're doing this already, of working with, with companies that would implement part of what you're saying. I mean, I think every new idea, my own included, um, has its flaws and needs to be validated and built and refined over time. I've always been amazed at how the ideas I have, which have propagated, have had dozens, sometimes hundreds of refinements made by others in order to make them successful. I agree. We need to get out there and put these things together. Well, then what we need is more than companies. We need to have governments that want to partner with the companies. The companies want to partner with the governments, and then we go to pilot. That is what we need, because the government is the authoritative source for the legal identity. So we basically need states or our national governments to partner up with us, like the uh, like in possibly Singapore or UAE or wherever. And we basically need them to pilot these ideas. So, so let me ask you, what do you think about the U.S. effort on the real ID? It's, it's good at a conceptual level. It's driving change across different states. But it's all what I call higgly piggly, to use a non technical term. We don't have good data standards, and then they don't work outside the US. So we live in a global planet. So what they're doing within the United States, within each state, is they try and get ready for real ID. It makes good sense. But it doesn't scale outside the US. And it's, it's sort of like a US centric solution. And what about regional things like Nexus? U.S. Canada. And oh, that, that's good too. But then that revolves around facial recognition. But it starts at when you're an adult or when you're basically getting a passport. So we have to start when a person's born. <laughs> now, what I, ha what I haven't talked about is that we. And we, are you not worried about the dangers of centralizing the identity control in a government agency? And well, I am. And as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm a real privacy advocate. I build privacy into the design. Yeah. So when a person is born, you're given a piece of paper that says that you're Ben or Guy or Katina. So that piece of paper doesn't it used to be valid because we couldn't produce them. And it was really expensive to reproduce them. Today, it's easy to do. So my idea is, is basically when you're born is to give you a physical identity and then to also give you a, a card that you, your parents or your legal guardian control that then says that you're Ben or Katina or Guy. And then they can then make decisions as they please as to how and when to use it. So I want to basically put the individual back in control of their legal identity. Um, and but then, you know, you're also advocating a centralized approach. Well, that's so, what the first certificate is, Ben. It is a centralized approach saying that you're Ben or Katina or Guy. You absolutely have to have somebody out there that says that, yes, you're Ben to your Guy. Now, what I haven't talked about, which I wrote lots about, I, in 2005, I was thinking about two things. How easy it would be to fraud birth certificates because I hadn't worked for a government yet. I was thinking about Dolly the Sheep. First mammal cloned in 1996. 
So I contacted Sir Alex Jeffries, who's the guy who invented the use of DNA for forensics. We had a long email chat back and forth, and both of us agreed that at the end of the day, when human cloning came available, we'd have to use biometrics to basically differentiate gene to a one, two, and three. Well, fast forward to when I was the governor of our, our identity architect, the governor of Alberta in 2012, 2015. And they told me, they said, Guy, we're the first jurisdiction to all North America to use facial recognition on our driver's licenses. They said, now many years later, it's no longer working. So I asked the dumb question, why? Ah, fake birth certificates. People were traveling across Canada with fake birth certificates establishing identities. They, then they take those identities and move up the food chain from driver's licenses, social insurance, families, health care, and passports. It's easy to do. So then uh, they created the chicken, and that hasn't happened. Now fast forward to 2015, this company called Boyala, B-O-Y-A-L-I-F-E. Google it, they'll click on the genomic section. You'll see they're working towards cloning a million cows per year. And in 2015, five years ago, the CEO publicly stated they could clone humans, but they won't. I.e., the cloning gene is out of the bottom. And so at some point in the near future, somebody somewhere is going to announce that they can clone humans. So this is part of Ta Pat Scannell's technology curve, going straight up. We have genetic engineering combining with bots, with bio, bio uh, bots. And all this stuff is happening. So all this is going to become very confusing at the so individual you, level. And how would you put limits on oppressive governments that want to use this to exclude minorities? I agree. I utterly agree. So how, how would you deal with that? It has to be well thought out. So what I say is that first of all, hey, that's not that's not a well, that's listen, not, Ben. It's a complicated subject, and I can't give you like. Tell a, me more. Tell me more. Uh, so, so, sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. sorry. I'm echoing. So sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say, isn't it wonderful we have two specialist speakers uh, this afternoon talking about underrepresented minorities uh, huh? and also refugees, uh, where. They will follow mm -hmm. Evan Selinger <laughs> on the biometrics uh, issues. But um, I think uh, we are hitting a, a very important point. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Just as a, uh, a warning point, I want us to continue this discussion if we can over the next three or four minutes and then invite Professor Giordano um, to, to uh, share his screen. But if we can continue to talk on this vital point, because I see both, I think we all see uh, both perspectives. In fact, this is the conundrum that I was alluding to. But if, if you could respond, Ben, and also uh, perhaps also give give a, a last sort of uh, discussion yeah. point each. Well, so on the on the danger side, I mean, oppressive governments. I mean, the current example is of India uh, seeking to suppress and exclude and ex uh, the Muslim minorities. Uh, we see it in. Middle Eastern countries, you see it in maybe some Asian countries, certainly some Asian countries, and the Uyghurs and Rohingya. Uh, there's many, many examples of governments uh, taking strong political action that harms the rights of, of minorities. So I think, you know, assuming that the government will do it and centralize and will do it in a good way is, is uh, uh, needs to be supplemented by other mechanisms that are bottom up that allow and empower individuals to deal with the case of oppressive governments. Um, so I think those are those are important. Yeah, I, you get the last word. Okay. So when a person is born in the not so distant future, we're going to have to take a biometric from them. Now, in my 2005 paper, I wrote on my own after talking to Alex. I suggest we use DNA, and I got a lot of criticism from people who said, guys, and we don't want to have national DNA databases in which you can profile an individual. Exactly the point you're raising there. So after a consideration, I agree. And I thought DNA is not a good uh, tool to use. However, there are other biometrics which can be can use to profile you, i.e. a fingerprint. So uh, at Berg, uh, when I want to pilot in Africa, I want to work with Michael Klingman on this in Africa and Asia, is we want to basically obtain babies bigger prints of birth. And we want to put them into a civil registration database, but that database is going to be designed on the assumption that it can be breached, and it's going to be designed to mitigate the risk of, uh, of uh, data illegal rights or exports. So that's the first Do point. you advocate blockchain then? Uh, I'm not so, not so keen on blockchain. Just push aside for a moment the blockchain issue. The first thing we have to work on is privacy for the individual. 
So when a person is born, that person's gonna be given a, a, a legal birth certificate on, on, on a document. It's all it's a card. It's also gonna give them a legal digital birth certificate. Now then they, their parents or themselves, and they're of age, can use them. Now that is the first point of self having good privacy by design. The person is in control of their legal identity. Now I wrote a paper just a few weeks ago about human migration. I wrote it from the perspective of the illegal, the migrant who's fleeing the country. I wrote it from the perspective of the country they're fleeing from. I wrote it from the perspective of the countries they're fleeing through, and the country they want to get to in the end. Now, the, the paper I wrote, I talk about these hundreds of millions of people who are going to be fleeing for their lives and their sustenance, and they're going to lie like, like crazy to basically have a better life. And to do that, then, that becomes hard because you're going to have all these governments, like the U.S., like the EU, where they're going to be bombarded with millions of people trying to get in, in and live there. And they're going to have to basically discern, is it Ben or Katina, or are they masquerading as Ben or Katina? Now, that is hard because what they're going to do is they're going to try and take these CRBS systems. They're going to basically use it and say, yeah, you're banned from Iran or you're banned from wherever. And they're going to basically be then use it to lock the doors on. So I wrote about that. There are no like wonderful, easy answers to this. But those are the questions of the day. Because we have to design a system that first of all says, yes, you're bad and you're bad, and we can basically validate that as you move around the planet that you're bad. But on the other hand, how are we going to mitigate the risk of the governments basically trying to prosecute you or control you? Those are the challenges, and there is not an easy answer. So um, I could not have hoped for a better beginning. Um, I'm particularly uh, amazed at meeting Guy through Pat Scannell. I'm also amazed at meeting uh, Professor Schneiderman in the flesh. The story goes uh, that uh, my brother, who's eight years my senior, was taught using Professor Schneiderman's textbook uh, back in the late 90s, uh, early 90s, uh, and I, sorry, late 90s, sorry, late 80s, late 80s. Uh, and then I inherited that textbook in 1994. Um, what a dream come true, Professor Schneiderman, to meet the man who actually went, and that's how you touch the screen, and that's what the opening is. I still can't believe you spoke to us this morning, but we thank you for the amazing contributions you've made and those that are to come. To Guy Huntington, you blow my mind. Just one of your uh, white papers, just go ka to my head, and I think you've got 29 of those you said in the last year and a half. They trigger real issues that we have to respond to as academics and as industry people, as governments, as different stakeholders in NGO land. In fact, we're going to have some of those diverse voices late this afternoon if you wanted to come.